Moses. When we study the great historical individualities of the past, such as those who have already claimed our attention during these lectures, namely Zarathustra, Hermes and Buddha, we are brought face to face with incidents and facts of interest to us as human beings because we feel that our whole soul life plays a part in the collective evolution of humanity. It is only when we look back to those great spiritual characters of bygone times who have helped to bring about the conditions in which we now live that we can truly comprehend our present circumstances. With regard to Moses, whose personality we are about to consider, the matter presents a wholly different aspect. Here we have the feeling that there is no limit to that direct influence exerted by all those events connected with his name that yet continue to affect the spiritual content of our souls. We still feel in our very bones, as it were, the workings of those impulses that emanated from this great outstanding patriarch. It seems to us that Moses is even now a living force in our thoughts and feelings, and as if, when we analyze our ideas and motives according to his doctrine and sentiments, we are in truth arraigning and searching our very souls. It is for this reason that all the persistent tradition directly associated with Moses seems to us more vivid, more actually present than that which is connected with those other great personalities to whom I have referred. It is, therefore, in a certain sense, less difficult to deal with this outstanding individuality, for through the Bible we are familiar with this mighty figure whose influence has endured even to the present time. Although the conscientious researches conducted by science during the past ten years and more have to a certain extent touched upon the surface and here and there thrown new light upon the history of Moses insofar as it can be gleaned from the Bible, when we look more deeply into the matter, we must admit that very little indeed has been altered with regard to the general impression we have received from our own personal study of the scriptures. Whenever we refer to any matter connected with Moses or to the great patriarch himself, we speak as if we were mentioning some subject well known throughout the widest circles. This fact somewhat simplifies the contemplation of the historical features. On the other hand, certain difficulties arise because of the manner in which the Bible tradition concerning Moses is expressed. This we at once comprehend when we call to mind the vicissitudes that accompanied the biblical researches of the nineteenth century. There is scarcely a single branch of human knowledge or sincere scientific endeavor, even when we include the natural sciences, that claims to so high a degree our deep admiration and reverence as do these investigations. I feel that this point should be repeatedly emphasized. The industry, the discrimination, the devoted and unselfish scientific application expended upon separate sections of the Bible in order to educe from their character and style a definite knowledge of their alleged origin are considered by those who have followed these researches closely as a work that has had no parallel during the 19th century. All this investigation of the past hundred years has, however, a tragic side. For the further the researches were carried, the more did they tend to place the Bible beyond the reach of the people. Those who consult the current literature concerning the results of these exhaustive studies can convince themselves of this fact. The difficulty arose because the Bible was dissected and split up, particularly in the case of the Old Testament, in an attempt to show, for instance, that a certain passage occurring in one part of the Bible owed its origin to a different current of tradition from that of a passage in another part. During this period of time, the whole subject matter 
gradually became welded together in a form that made it necessary for it to be first separated out in this scholarly manner so that it might be understood. In a certain sense, then, the outcome of these investigations must be looked upon as tragic since they were fundamentally wholly negative in character and contributed nothing toward the continuance of that vivifying influence which the Bible is capable of exerting and which has lived in the hearts and souls of humankind for thousands of years. The movement toward true spiritual development that we have termed spiritual science is chiefly concerned with constructive activities and is not interested in mere criticism as is so often the case with other sciences. In our time its most important task is to bring about once again an accurate and proper understanding of the Bible. In this regard it puts forward the following question, quote, Is it not essential that we should first penetrate into the very depths of the import and significance underlying the whole character of the ancient biblical traditions, and then, only after they are fully and clearly understood, inquire as to their origin? Close quote. Such a procedure is not easy, especially with reference to the Old Testament, and is particularly difficult with respect to those sections dealing with the great outstanding figure and personality of Moses. We would now ask, quote, What is it that spiritual science has to say regarding the peculiar nature of those ancient biblical descriptions? Close quote. It tells us that those external events associated with this or that personality or nation have been chronicled in the order and manner in which they actually occurred as viewed from the standpoint of external history. Following this method, the personality of Moses is so depicted that his experiences in the physical world are represented just as they took place in relation to space and time. It is only when we have made a profound study of the Bible through the medium of spiritual science that we realize that a biblical description concerned with external happenings and experiences may become merged in one of quite another nature. It is often with difficulty that we can distinguish this change in fundamental character. We are told, for instance, of journeys and other worldly events that we accept as such, all unnoticed as the account continues. We then find ourselves confronted with a graphic narrative of a wholly different order. It seems to us that a certain journey is represented as continuing from one definite place to another, and as if we were expected to look upon the account of events depicted in the latter part of the narrative, in the same light as the external physical happenings described at the beginning. In reality, however, the latter part of such an account may actually be a figurative portrayal of the soul life of the particular personality to whom the story has reference. It then has no connection whatever with external worldly events, but depicts the soul experiences, struggles, and conquests through which this special being is raised to a higher degree of soul development, greater enlightenment, a more advanced stage of activity, or a mission concerned with the world's evolution. In such a case, descriptions of outside events pass over without any noticeable change directly into pictorial representations which, though they remain similar in style and character, have absolutely no significance with regard to external physical happenings, but refer only to the inner experiences of the soul. This assertion will always remain a mere assertion to those who are unable to utilize the methods of spiritual science and thus enter gradually and understandingly into the strange and unusual features associated with many of the graphic narratives found in the Bible. More particularly, will this be the case with regard to those sections dealing with the patriarch, Moses? 
When, however, we study this strange method of representation deeply, we notice that when, at a certain point in a story, the description of external physical events changes into one of soul experiences, the whole style and fundamental character of the account alters, while a new element suddenly makes its appearance. If we ask ourselves, quote, how does it come about that we are able to perceive this change, Close quote, we can answer only that we realize it because of a conviction that comes to us from the soul. This curious descriptive method we have just characterized lies at the base of ancient religious historical narratives, more especially when they are concerned with personalities who have reached a high standard of discernment and understanding of the soul's action and inner workings. The further we advance, and the more deeply we become immersed in the study of spiritual science, the greater is our faith in this singular style of representation. But, just because of the strangeness of this method, it is in some ways far from easy to gain a clear comprehension of the true meaning of certain passages that occur in the graphic delineation of Moses. On the one hand, we have the Bible with its apparently straightforward narrative, but on the other hand, there are difficulties owing to the curious way in which the account is presented when the subject matter is of an especially profound character. This fact has resulted in the customary interpretations being much too liberal in many cases. When, for instance, we consider the conception of ancient Hebrew history as advanced by the philosopher Philo, who lived at the time of the founding of Christianity, we realize at once that he endeavored to portray the whole record of the old Hebrew nation as if it were an allegory. Philo aimed at a figurative representation in which the entire history of this ancient race becomes a sort of symbolic account of the soul experiences of a people. In so doing, Philo went too far, and for this reason. He did not possess the judgment and insight born of spiritual science that would have enabled him to discern and know when the descriptions concerning external events glided into portrayals relative to soul life. As we proceed, it will be realized that in Moses we have a personality who influenced directly the active course of human evolution and whose mission it was to enlighten humankind concerning matters of the utmost import and significance. When we experience that deep sense, so pregnant with meaning, through which we become aware that his deeds still touch a chord within our souls, then do we feel that a full and clear comprehension of the Moses impulse is to us a necessity. We will, therefore, without further preamble, enter at once upon the question of his great mission. The true object of his life's work cannot be fully understood unless we presuppose that the Bible narrative was based upon actual and specific knowledge of a certain fundamental change in the human being's psychic condition, to which we have already referred when considering the individualities of Zarathustra, Hermes, and Buddha. We then drew attention to the fact that during the course of evolution the soul life of the human being has gradually undergone a definite modification from a divine primordial clairvoyant state to that of our present-day intellectual consciousness. I must once again bring back to your minds a statement made in previous lectures, namely that in primeval times the soul of human beings was so constituted that during certain intermediary conditions between that of sleeping and being awake, they could gaze upon the spirit world, and that things thus observed, and which were truly of the spiritual realms, manifested as pictures or visions. It is these visions that in many cases have been perpetuated in the form of mythological legends of olden times. In reply to the question, quote, How can the reality of this ancient clairvoyant consciousness 
be proved externally and without the aid of spiritual science. Close quote. We would say that the answer is to be found in the results of certain precise and painstaking investigations carried on even in our own time, but which have not as yet received general recognition. We would point out that comparatively recently some of our mythologists, during their researches into the origin of ancient mythical visions and legends that have arisen among certain separate and distinctive peoples, have been forced to assume the existence of an altogether different conscious state in order to account for these ancient myths and concepts. I have often referred to an interesting book entitled The Riddle of the Sphinx by Ludwig Leisner, a mythologist who must be ranked as the most prominent among the modern investigators in this field of research. The Riddle of the Sphinx is regarded as one of the most important works of its kind. Leisner draws attention to the fact that certain myths appear to form a sequel to events typical of experiences in a dream world. He did not advance so far as the study of spiritual science, and he was quite unaware that he had in reality laid the foundation stone of a true knowledge and understanding of the ancient mythologies. We cannot, however, regard myths and legends merely in the light of transfigured typical dreams, as Leisner has done. We must recognize in them the products of a former condition of human consciousness in which the human being could apprehend the spirit world in pictorial visions that later found expression in mythical imagery. It is impossible to comprehend the old fables and legends unless we start with the hypothesis that they were evolved from a different form of conscious state. It is just because this basic assumption has been lacking that they are so little understood. This prehistoric soul state has now given way to our present intellectual consciousness, the latter of which may be briefly characterized as follows. We alternate between a condition of sleeping and of being awake. In our wakeful state we seize upon those impressions that come to us from the external world through the medium of our senses. These ideas we group together, combining them by means of our intellect. This material form of intellectual consciousness, which acts through our power of understanding and intelligence, has now superseded the ancient clairvoyant soul state. We have thus characterized a particular episode of history and presented it in the aspect it assumes when we make a profound study of the evolution of humankind. There is yet another factor underlying the manner in which Bible narratives are expressed. It appears that a special mission was assigned to each nation, race, and tribe in connection with the evolution and development of human beings, and that the ancient clairvoyant forms of consciousness manifested in different ways according to the capacity and temperament of the various peoples. For this reason we find fundamentally among the mythologies and pagan religions of divers nations such uniformity of tradition concerning this old clairvoyant state. We thus realize that we are not dealing with just one abstract idea or unit in this ancient conception of the world, for the most varied missions were assigned to nations and to peoples who differed very greatly from one another. Thus it came about that the universal consciousness found expression in many and varying forms. If we would indeed understand all that the evolution of humankind implies, then we must take into consideration the fact that it does not consist merely of a meaningless succession of civilizations, but that throughout the whole course of human progress and development there is found interwoven both significance and purport. Hence we find that a certain order of conscious state may reappear and be found active in some later civilization, because like a fresh page or a newborn flower, it has something to add to that which has gone before. 
for the whole meaning and purpose of human evolution implies ever recurrent and successive forms of manifestation. We can best understand the people of a nation from the perspective of spiritual science when we realize that all races, be they ancient Indians, Persians, Babylonians, Greeks or Romans, had a definite mission to fulfill and that each nation gave expression in some special and distinctive manner to that which was active and could live in human consciousness. We cannot rightly comprehend these different peoples unless we are in a position to apprehend and realize the nature of their mission from their individual characteristics. The whole evolution of humankind proceeds in such a way that to each nation a certain time is apportioned. When this period draws to a close, the nation's work is done. It is as if the hour had struck, the seeds had brought forth their fruit, and the task was ended. It may, however, happen that with this or that race certain peculiarities of temperament or natural disposition corresponding to a former period may persist. In such a case the particular nation has, as it were, passed over the appointed time when a new mission should be entered upon and take the place of that which was before. Thus it is that certain singular and distinctive national traits may endure and become active at a later period, at a time when the objective course of human evolution substitutes some fresh purpose for that which was previously determined. A course of events of this nature is especially noticeable with the Egyptians, and we have already become acquainted with their peculiar characteristics during the lecture devoted to Hermes. The Egyptians had been assigned a lofty mission in connection with the collective progress and development of humanity, and all that was embodied therein was perfected and fulfilled, while the seeds of that which was to follow had been laid in the Egyptian civilization. The people of this great nation, however, retained their original temperament and singular characteristics and were not of themselves capable of formulating and undertaking a new mission. It thus came about that the control and government of the succeeding community passed into other hands. The source out of which the fresh movement evolved was fundamentally Egyptian, but the mission itself was destined to assume a different character. Here we note something akin to a change of tendency in the whole purport of human evolution. In order that we may understand the circumstances, it is necessary that we immerse ourselves deeply in the study of all that pertained to the growth and development of the Egyptian mission. When Moses had acquired all the knowledge and information possible concerning this matter, he pondered deeply, and the souls of his people were stirred. It was, however, not his task to carry on the ancient Egyptian mission. He was meant to evolve out of it some entirely new plan that he might instill into the course of human evolution. It is because his concept was so mighty so comprehensive and so penetrating in its nature that the personality of Moses exerted such a powerful influence upon the whole history of humankind. The way in which the Moses mission evolved out of the past evolution of the Egyptian people is even in our day of the greatest interest, and its example and study still bear abundant fruit. The knowledge and understanding that came to Moses from the Egyptians and were enhanced through his contact with the lofty and eternal course of spiritual development have reached ever outward until they have now become active in our soul life. The impression we have gained of Moses is that of a personality not directly dependent upon any particular period or upon any special mission for the wisdom that was his to impart to humanity. We regard him as one whose soul must have been stirred by those eternally surging waves of divine influence that always find new channels 
through which to reach deep down into the evolution of humankind, so that human beings may be productive and bring forth goodly fruits. It is as if the everlasting germ of wisdom implanted in the soul of Moses found its fitting soil and ripened in the light of the knowledge that came to him from the Egyptian civilization. The Bible account of the finding of Moses enclosed in an ark shortly after his birth, Exodus 2.5, is a symbolic description according to the ancient mode from which we are to understand that in Moses we are concerned with a soul that drew upon eternal sources for the most lofty of those concepts that it proffered to humanity. Anyone who understands the singular form in which such religious narratives are developed knows that this particular style is always indicative of some matter of deep significance. During former lives of this series, we have learned that when human beings desire to raise their capacity of apprehension to the higher level of the spiritual spheres, they must pass through certain stages of soul development during which they completely shut themselves off from the external world and also from that ever-wakeful call emanating from the lowest forces of the soul. Let us suppose that we wished to express figuratively that at birth some personality entering upon earthly life came upon the world endowed with certain divine gifts that would later raise him to great heights in his relation to humankind. We might well indicate this concept by developing a narrative telling us that it was essential that this being, shortly after birth, should pass through a material experience of such a nature as to cause all his sense perceptions and powers of external apprehension to be, for a time, entirely shut off from the physical world. Footnote. The underlying suggestion here is that the fact that it is necessary for the perceptual faculties to be held in abeyance for the time being indicates that this particular personality already possessed other faculties of a spiritual order which, being thus freed, would become operative. End of footnote. Viewed in this light, the Bible story concerning the discovery of Moses becomes quite intelligible. We read that the daughter of the Egyptian king Pharaoh Bracket sent her maid to the river to fetch the ark in which was the child, close bracket, and that she herself called him Moses. In quotes, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Close quote, Exodus 2.10. Those who are aware of the true meaning of the name, in quotes, Moses, know that it signifies this act, as is indicated in the Bible. From this graphic narrative, we are to understand that the daughter of Pharaoh who is here symbolic of Egyptian culture, guided the influx of external life into a soul touched with the attributes of eternity. At the same time, we find intimated in a wonderful way that the imperishable message Moses was destined to bring to humanity was, one might say, enfolded and lay within an outer shell, encompassed and enveloped by the old Egyptian culture and mission. Next follow descriptions of external events that occurred during the life development of Moses. And we realize once again from the form in which they are presented that they have reference to actual outer happenings. All that we read concerning the vicissitudes of Moses, especially where mention is made of his grief and distress over the bondage of his people in Egypt, may be regarded as an actual account of mundane events. As the story continues, it merges almost imperceptibly into a graphic portrayal of his inner soul life and soul experiences. This occurs at that place where it is stated that he fled away and was finally guided to a priest of Midian whose name was Jethro or Reuel. Reuel, sorry, is Dale aside, is R E U apostrophe E L Ruel Royel Reuel sorry I don't know how to pronounce that end of aside from Exodus two fifteen through twenty 
Anyone having the knowledge and discernment necessary to discover the existence of a story of this nature, underlying what at first sight would appear to be an ordinary spiritual narrative, would at once realize, from the very names alone, that the account changes its whole character at this point and passes over to a description of soul events. We do not mean to suggest that Moses did not actually set out upon a journey to some temple sanctuary or abode of priestly learning, but rather that the whole narrative has been most ingeniously developed and told in such a manner that external happenings are deliberately intermingled with the soul experiences of the great patriarch. Thus do we find that all outer life experiences mentioned at this point are suggestive of the trials and tribulations against which Moses struggled in order to attain a more exalted soul state. What then is the actual significance of Jethro? From the Bible we learn that he was one of the of the most mysterious individualities whom we meet again and again when we study the evolution and development of the human race. They are beings who stand supreme in having won their way through toil and effort to that lofty standard of knowledge and discernment which can be acquired, slowly and gradually, only through true experience of the soul's inner conflicts. It is in this way alone that human beings may gain true understanding of those grand spiritual heights where lie the paths traversed by such exalted ones. Moses became to a certain extent a disciple of Jethro, and through this association his mission was destined to receive a direct impulse. Now, Jethro was one of those incomprehensible beings who withhold their innermost nature from the apprehension of humankind, while acting on occasion as teachers and leaders of human beings. Today there is much doubt and incredulity regarding the reality of such mystic personalities, but that they have indeed existed becomes evident to every earnest student of the historical development of humanity. The account of the experiences of Moses, while he was a disciple of this great wise priest, opens with a description of his meeting with Jethro's seven daughters, bracket, in the land of Midian, Exodus 2.15.16, close bracket, near a well, parenthesis, a symbol betokening a source of wisdom, close parenthesis. Anyone who would comprehend the deeper significance underlying a graphic narrative of this nature must remember above all that mystical descriptions of every period have symbolically portrayed all such knowledge and power as the soul itself may display in the form of female figures, even down to Goethe, who in the closing words of Faust alludes to the eternal feminine. In the seven daughters of Jethro then we recognize the seven human soul forces over which that priestly character exercised control. Footnote, the seven human soul forces, to which reference is here made, are those cosmic influences that act through the soul in connection with the seven principles of the human organism. The first four principles are as follows, the physical body, the etheric or life body, the astral body, and the capital I, or body of consciousness. The latter sets about transforming the first three by acting upon the psychic principles. Within the I we have the last three principles, Atman or spirit human, as transmuted physical body, Buddhi or life spirit, as transmuted etheric or life body, and Manas or spirit self, as transmuted astral body. The latter, Manas, is partly developed. Of Atman and Buddhi there is merely a seed. End of footnote. We must bear in mind that in those ancient times when human consciousness was still enlivened by the old clairvoyance, other views prevailed regarding the nature of the human soul and its various powers. The only way in which we can form any conception of this primordial consciousness is by starting with our current ideas as a basis. We speak today of the human being's soul and its powers of thinking, feeling and willing as if these forces were within us, contained, one might say, in the very soul itself. 
This concept is essentially correct as viewed from the standpoint of intellectual consciousness. Primeval human beings, under the influence of their gift for clairvoyant vision, regarded the soul and its workings from a different aspect. They were not aware of any centralized system in this connection and did not look upon their powers of thought, feeling and will as forces whose midpoint of activity is situated in the ego and which determine the oneness and individuality of the soul. Instead, they regarded themselves as wholly subservient to the macrocosm and its several forces, while each separate source of energy within their souls seemed to be linked with specific and divine spiritual beings. This concept may be compared to one in which we might conceive our thought activities as prompted and maintained by some spiritual soul power other than that which stimulates and influences the faculties of feeling and will. We would thus picture separate currents of spiritual energy as flowing inward from the macrocosm and activating our powers of thought, feeling and willing. Although in these days we form no such conception, it was thus that primeval human beings regarded the soul, not as a centralized unit in itself, but rather as a stage upon which the divine spiritual powers of the cosmos might unceasingly play their several parts. In connection with Moses, reference is made to seven such forces conceived as active upon the stage of soul life. We have only to turn to Plato to realize that the human being's outlook on the evolution of human consciousness changed and became, in general, more and more abstract and intellectual. Plato conceived, in quotes, ideas to be living entities, leading an existence such as in our time could be thought of only in connection with matter. Each separate soul force is pictured as possessing an attribute that plays its part in the theater of the soul's totality. Gradually, the conceptions formed regarding the capacity of the soul became increasingly abstract, while the unity of the ego assumed more and more its rightful place in human beings' concepts. Strange as it may appear, in the medieval conception of the seven liberal arts, we can still distinguish in abstract form characteristics typical of the symbolic representation of the seven active spiritual forces of soul life in the seven daughters of the Midianite priest Jethro. Footnote. In the Middle Ages, the liberal arts, arte liberales, were considered to be seven in number, namely music, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Plato and Aristotle distinguished between the practical arts and the so-called liberal arts, of which the latter were concerned with progress of an ethical or literary character. End of footnote. The manner in which the seven liberal arts evolved and were brought to light was as a last dim echo, touched with a modern trend of thought, of the consciousness that recognized that seven distinct faculties persist and remain active in the scenes staged in the theater of the human soul. When we consider these concepts, we begin to realize that while, from the spiritual standpoint, Moses was confronted with the collective aspect of these seven human soul forces, his chief mission was nevertheless to implant one particular soul influence in the form of an impulse deeply and fully into the course of human evolution. It was possible for him to do so because it lay in the blood and in the temperament of his people to manifest a special interest in that outstanding soul power, the activities of which have been felt down to our own time and which it was his task to instill. We refer to that dominant soul energy that unites all those forces previously regarded as separate and detached into one centralized and homogeneous bond of inner soul life, the life of the true self, the ego. We are next told that one of the daughters of Jethro married Moses. This means that, within his soul, 
one of these forces became especially active, so that so much so that owing to its influence it became for a long period a dominating power in human evolution, reducing all other soul forces to a unified soul ego. Statements such as these must be made with the greatest reserve, for in our present age humankind has no adequate faculty or organ with which they may realize that many biblical descriptions that apparently represent external happenings are presented solely for the purpose of drawing attention to the fact that at the time at which the events portrayed took place, a particular soul was undergoing some experience of inner development. In other words, the soul was especially concerned with and attracted to its individual mission. It is also apparent that one special attribute the old Egyptians did not possess, the inspiration that Moses drew from the human ego force at the midpoint of the human being's soul powers, was for him the criterion to which he referred his judgment. We can therefore with reason assert that the true mission of the ancient Egyptian nation was to found a culture based upon the practice and methods of primeval clairvoyance. All that is best of those things handed down to us from the Egyptian civilization has sprung from the singular nature of those peculiar psychic powers once possessed by the Egyptian priests and the leaders of the people. But the time came when, with respect to the old Egyptian mission, the cosmic clock had run down, and the call had to go forth to humankind to unfold and develop those soul forces that it was ordained should, for a long period of time, supersede that ancient passive clairvoyant condition in the future evolution of humanity. Ego consciousness, intellectuality, rationalism, reason and understanding, with their spheres of action in the external perceptual world, were destined to replace the old clairvoyant consciousness in the human race yet to come. I have already stated how in the future of humankind clairvoyant power and intellectual consciousness will be united. Even now humanity is advancing toward a time when these two conscious states will be universally interwoven and co-active throughout the human race. The most important element in human culture, regarded from our modern standpoint, received its first impulse through Moses. Thus we have a sense of persistency in connection with the Moses impulse that still exists in our soul life and power. To Moses was granted a certain capacity for intellectual thought and action controlled by reason and understanding. This ability and his wisdom were instilled into him in a singular and unusual manner, because all those concepts and ideas that came to him and were destined to manifest and bear fruit in some particular way, at a later period, must first have been implanted in a fashion conforming with the peculiar methods in vogue in those ancient times. Here we come upon a remarkable fact, namely that later generations of humankind were directly indebted to Moses for their power of expanding and developing their understanding and intellect through the medium of their eco-consciousness, so that they might reason and ponder upon the world and gain enlightenment through inner intellectual contemplation while yet fully awake. The manner in which a consciousness of intellectuality came to Moses must have been through flashes of intellectual awareness similar in nature to the old clairvoyant manifestations. He was indeed the recipient of that first initial impulse toward the new order of reasoned judgment and understanding, while at the same time he possessed the old clairvoyant power, being in fact under the influence of the last of its promptings. All the knowledge and enlightenment that was acquired by later generations, independently of clairvoyance, was accessible to Moses through its aid. His understanding, discernment and intuition in the sphere of pure reason came to him when his soul passed into that same clairvoyant condition 
which he had experienced when under the influence of the old Midianite priest. We have the incident of the burning bush, which glowed with fire of such a nature that it was not consumed. In this case, the spirit of the cosmos manifested before Moses in an entirely new manner, beyond the clairvoyant knowledge of the Egyptians to explain. Everyone who is acquainted with the essential facts knows that during the course of development the human soul reaches a point when the aspect of external objects gradually undergoes a change, so that they appear interwoven with that mysterious background of archetypes from which they emanate. The spectacle of the burning bush, so magnificently portrayed in the Bible, is recognized by all who are advanced in spiritual discernment as an instance of human apprehension of the spirit world. We now realize that the enlightenment Moses received in clairvoyant form must have been of the nature of a new consciousness proceeding from the great spirit of the cosmos, the spirit that is ever active and weaves throughout the whole material world. Ancient peoples believed in a plurality of cosmic forces, and they conceived these forces as operating in the human soul in such a way that the soul's power did not present a unit, for the forces were manifold in nature, while the soul was regarded merely as the scene of their active expression. It was for Moses to recognize a cosmic spirit of a very different order, one that did not manifest as soul power, owing its origin to various spirit influences, that while exhibiting a certain similitude, find ultimate expression in varied form. The spirit of the cosmos, which it was ordained that Moses should apprehend, was of a wholly different character, for its revelation can alone take place in the innermost and holiest midpoint of soul life, the ego. There works the spirit of the universe, in the place where the human soul is conscious of its very center, When the human soul feels that the ego is linked with the weaving and the life of the spirit, in the same way as the people of old realized that their being was truly related to the cosmic forces, then can it apprehend those things first revealed to Moses through his clairvoyant powers. These revelations must be regarded as forming the cosmic basis from which came the great impulse he gave to humankind that primal impulse enabling humanity through its reasoning faculties and understanding alone, bracket, unaided by the old clairvoyance, close bracket, to associate and compare physical phenomena and to recognize in them factors underlying all continuity in the material world. If we consider the center of our soul life today, it appears to be of extremely poor content despite the fact that this content represents our most intense life experiences. Certain people, especially those of a highly gifted and talented character, as for instance Jean-Paul, have felt some time during the course of earthly existence that they were actually confronted with their true center of being. In his autobiography, Jean-Paul tells this story. Footnote first, Jean-Paul, 1763 to 1825, Born Johann Paul Friedrich Richter was a popular German writer whose novels and stories were welcomed by a wide circle of admirers during his lifetime. And a footnote and now a quote from Jean Paul. Never shall I forget an inner vision that I once experienced and which I have not as yet described to anyone. In this vision I was present at the birth of my true conscious self and I clearly recollect both the time and the place of this occurrence. It was one morning when I was a very young child. I was standing in the doorway of our house, and as I looked toward the left in the direction of the woodshed, there suddenly came to me an inner vision flashed down as lightning from heaven of the words, quote, I am an I, close quote, bracket, ich bin ein ich, close bracket. and these words remained for a space shining brightly. And in that moment and in that place, my eye had looked upon itself for the first time. 
and the gaze would endure forever. Illusion due to defective memory is hardly conceivable in this case, since no outside incidents or topics could mingle extraneous matter with an event that could take place only in the secret and most holy seclusion of the human being's innermost being, and the very novelty of which caused minor details to be deeply impressed upon my memory. Close quote. This, quote, secret and most holy seclusion, close quote, appears to be the most intense and powerful condition of our soul life. But human beings cannot be so aware of this particular soul state as of many another, for it is lacking in conscious plenitude. When human beings withdraw themselves to this central point, then do they indeed realize that through those wondrous words, I am, so earnest and forceful, but at the same time so meager in actual word content, there ever resounds the dominant tone of their innermost soul-being. That spirit from the cosmos, which Moses clearly apprehended as a homogeneous unity, is unceasingly active in that abode of secret and most holy seclusion. No wonder that when this cosmic essence was first revealed to Moses, he cried out, quote, If I am appointed to the task of standing before the people in order to inaugurate a new civilization based upon the consciousness of self, who will believe me? In whose name shall I proclaim my mission? Close quote. And the answer came, quote, Thou shalt say, I am that I am. Close quote in subquotes as well. This profound declaration signifies that the name of the divinity who reveals himself in the quote, secret and most holy seclusion close quote, of human nature cannot be otherwise proclaimed than with words that designate the consciousness of self-being. In the phenomenon of the burning bush, Moses discerned the Yahweh or Jehovah nature. And we can well understand that from the moment when the name Yahweh broke in upon his consciousness as I am, there came a new current, a new element into the course of human evolution that was destined from that time on to supplant the old Egyptian civilization. The ancient culture had merely served to develop the soul of Moses in order that he might, in a position, be in a position, excuse me, to truly appreciate and cope with those most exalted personalities and difficult situations that it would be his lot to encounter during the course of his life experiences. Up to that cosmic hour, the Egyptians had had a mission to fulfill based upon the powers of a bygone clairvoyant conscious state. But the time allotted to that mission had passed. Henceforth the race, if it should continue to live on, would remain endowed with the same temperament and national characteristics it had heretofore possessed. It had found no means whereby it might raise itself and cross the boundary that separated the old epoch from the new. But at this very time it was ordained that the Hebrew people would arise and that Moses should point out a way. In remembrance of the events connected with the quote, passing over close quote, by Moses and his people from that period that was ended to that which was to come, there has ever since been celebrated the Feast of the Passover. This festival should constantly remind us that it was Moses who was blessed with the understanding and the wisdom that made possible the transition from the old order of consciousness to the new. The Egyptians could not span this gulf, and as the nation tarried, the waves of time swept onward. It is in the manner outlined here that we must regard the relationship of Moses to the Egyptians and to his people. We next come to the conference between Moses and Pharaoh. It is easy to see that when these two came together they could not understand each other. The account is intended to convey the idea that all those things about which Moses spoke proceeded from an entirely changed order of human consciousness and must therefore have been quite unintelligible to Pharaoh, in whom only the old clairvoyant Egyptian culture continued to be active. 
That such was the case is evident from the way in which the records are expressed, for Moses spoke in a new language. He clothed his speech in words that emanated from the ego consciousness of the human soul and were therefore incomprehensible to Pharaoh, who could follow only the old train of thought. The Hebrew race was by nature thoroughly adapted to receive the great enlightenment that it was the mission of Moses to impart. What was its actual character? It was ordained that the old clairvoyant state should give place to an intellectual reasoning consciousness. It has been pointed out in previous lectures that clairvoyant consciousness is in no way connected with our external corporeal nature and that it unfolds freely just at those times when human beings through their soul training have released themselves from their external bodily instrument so that they may be active and untrammeled in their soul life. The intellectual consciousness is associated with the brain and the blood and its means of expression lies in the human organism. The continued spiritual development of the conscious state that had previously hovered over the physical structure had up to the time of Moses been brought about solely through the relationship existing between master and pupil, but it had now to accommodate itself to a new condition in which it would be directly connected with and confined to the physical organism and to the flood that would flow in the veins of the people from generation to generation. It was for this reason that the enlightenment Moses was destined to give to humanity, so as to bring about an impulse toward an intellectual culture, could be instilled only into a nation in which the blood of the race would continue to flow vigorously throughout future generations and therefore of such a nature was the instrument chosen to receive the basal principles of the new cognitive faculty. The new reasoning consciousness, the seeds of which were implanted by Moses, was not destined to live on merely in the spirit, for it had been ordained that the people thus chosen should be taken away from the Egyptian nation in the midst of which they had been made ready, and that from that time onward, isolated and as a separate race, they must develop through centuries those external methods and means that would in future form the basis of an intellectual culture which should continue throughout all coming ages. We thus realize that the world's history is full of significance and purport and that the spiritual element is closely related to all external physical agents. It is clear that the author of the Bible narrative is at great pains to present the account of the transition of the ancient Egyptian culture to that of Moses in its true light and meaning as an episode in the history of the world. We have, for instance, the story of the passing of the children of Israel through the Red Sea. Concealed beneath this narrative lies a wonderful truth relative to the evolution of humankind, but which is to be understood only by those who clearly comprehend the whole nature of this incident. In connection with the Egyptians, we find proof of the link that necessarily exists between the soul powers and the clairvoyant faculty. We obtain the clearest insight into this matter when we take the animal organism as our starting point, but I am sure you will not assume that by so doing I would suggest that human nature resembles that of the animal kingdom. We must first imagine that the whole outlook and soul life of brute creation are dreamy and torpid compared with the intellectual soul state of human beings. Although primeval human clairvoyance most certainly cannot be directly compared with the soul life of animals, from which it differs radically, we can nevertheless clearly trace a definite relationship between the instinctive existence and soul life of brute creation and that of the ancient soul life of human beings. Although it is often exaggerated, that there is a certain amount of truth underlying those stories that tell of animals leaving districts subject to earthquakes and volcanic disturbances days before an eruption takes place. It has certainly happened in some cases that while human beings who regard and apprehend all things through the medium of their intellect have remain, remained unmoved, the animals in the neighborhood have been aroused. 
Anyone who has a knowledge of spiritual science knows that brute nature is so closely interwoven with all life in its immediate environment that we can, in a sense, assert that animals possess a measure of instinctive understanding which, through its rudimentary powers, controls and regulates their existence. This faculty is no longer found in human beings because they have developed a higher intellectual quality through which they are able to form reasoned concepts and ideas concerning all things that come within their cognizance. But this very logical capacity has in effect torn asunder that close tie with nature they once enjoyed. We must picture that in primeval times human beings possessed similar instinctive cognition, both in connection with the old clairvoyant state and also with their relationship to the external phenomena of nature, a kind of intuition whereby the ancients could say, quote, such and such events are about to occur, and for this reason we must take certain steps to prepare ourselves in advance, Close quote. Just in the same way, some people who are suitably constituted raise themselves through striving of soul to a higher power of discernment and attain to an order of apprehension concerning matters connected with nature for which no cause or reason can be assigned. Those who use the forces of their soul and through its attributes and its virtues win power to utter statements beyond the scope of their intellectual consciousness feel uncomfortable when people come to them and say, Why is that so? Give us proof of your assertions. Such persons never realize that knowledge of this nature comes by quite a different path from that born of logical reasoning. It is a striking and pertinent fact that Goethe, when he looked out a window, could often predict hours in advance what kind of weather was in store. If we conceive faculties of this nature as existing among the ancients and manifesting in such a way that through direct contact with the spirit world the people of old were able to be closely associated with creation and the phenomena of nature, Parenthesis, but in a manner entirely different from that which is the case today, close parenthesis. then we can realize and picture at least one fundamental feature of the old clairvoyance relative to the practical conduct of life. In olden times, humanity did not possess meteorological observatories, and there were no weather forecasts published in newspapers or in other ways, as there are today. But the ancients were endowed with a sense of perception that clearly foretold what would occur, and they governed their actions in accordance with the impressions received. This was especially the case with the old Egyptians, among whom the faculty of sense perception was developed to a very high degree. They had no knowledge of our modern science or our analytical methods, but nonetheless they knew how to comport themselves so as to be in living harmony with the whole surrounding world. Because the cosmic hour had struck for the Egyptian culture, however, this faculty, once so prominent, fell into decadence, and the Egyptian people became less and less capable of understanding and dealing with the facts and realities of nature, and could no longer foretell from the grouping and interaction of external elements and factors what should be their attitude and mode of conduct. Humanity was now destined to learn how to investigate and to study the arrangement and interrelationships of these external elements. It was Moses who could impart the impulse, but the impulse that he gave came even then from his old clairvoyant consciousness. While Moses and his people stood upon the shore of the Red Sea, he realized through an understanding somewhat similar to our own, but which still unfolded clairvoyantly, that exceptional natural circumstances, namely an unusual combination of an east wind and ebb tide, together with a channel-like passage, made it possible at the right moment for him to lead the Israelites across shallow waters. This historical fact has been graphically portrayed so that we may realize that Moses was indeed the founder of a new and universal mode of intellectual apprehension that is still active in our day and through which humanity will once more learn to bring the practical affairs of life 
into harmony with the existing order of nature, even as was done by that great patriarch. The Egyptians were a nation whose hour was spent. They could no longer foretell what would come to pass. The power of the old instinctive faculties that were theirs in long ago times had waned, and they found themselves once more in a position, as in the past, when a decision must be made. In olden times they would have cried out, quote, It is too late. We cannot now make the passage. Close quote. But that innate gift of discernment they had so long enjoyed had all but vanished, and they knew not how to live in the new intellectual conscious state. Therefore they stood before the Red Sea, helpless and bewildered. The old clairvoyant consciousness could no longer be their guide. They followed, and disaster overtook them. Here we find the new Moses element in direct contrast with the old, and we see the ancient clairvoyant faculty, and we see that the ancient clairvoyant faculty had so far declined that it could no longer be relied upon, because it was unsuited to the new age. It was the forerunner of calamity. When we look beneath the surface of such apparently external graphic narratives as this and come upon the matter the narrator really has in mind, we find that the stories often characterize great turning points in the evolution of humankind. We realize that it is no light task to deduce from the peculiar descriptions found in the ancient writings the true significance of the various personalities mentioned, such as, for instance, Moses in the circumstances we have just quoted. It is clear from what follows later in the account that at that time, when it had to be decided whether Moses should or should not lead his people to Palestine, he still relied entirely upon the old clairvoyance. In his case, his intellectual enlightenment was fundamentally dependent upon this faculty. It was because the blood that flowed in the veins of the Jewish people made them by nature especially suitable to the task of laying the foundation of the impending movement toward intellectuality, that it was ordained that they should be led forth and guided to the promised land. The knowledge and wisdom Moses acquired through his clairvoyant powers sufficed to impart the necessary impulse, but could not itself be of the new culture for this new cultural faculty was destined to manifest in ways that would be the antithesis of the old order of clairvoyant consciousness. From the Bible account it is evident that Moses felt that his call was merely to lead his people to a certain place. He was not to take them into the promised land. The last stage of the journey must be left to those who were destined to embrace the new order of intellectual development. Although Moses was the prophet of the Lord, who manifests in our very ego being, we are nevertheless given to understand that it was only by virtue of his clairvoyant faculty that he could become conscious of the mighty word of the great spirit of the cosmos. When, at last, he was left to himself with the task of aiding his people, he fled to his tent so that through his clairvoyant powers he might once more be in the actual presence of his God. Then it was that a voice said, quote, Because thou canst not carry out all that is betokened by those thoughts that come to thee with visions, henceforth must another be the leader of thy people. Close quote. The words of this decree shed a radiance around the great patriarch, for they implied that Moses, with his clairvoyant faculty, was a prophet, the like of whom would no more be seen in Israel. We are to understand that Moses was the last among the ancients to be endowed with the old order of psychic discernment. From that time on would a form of intellection wholly independent of this gift spread its influence among all peoples fitted to the task and the human being's actions and cognition be based on the power to reason and tradition alone. Thus might the ego, the truth of which had already been recognized, by those who had understanding of the fundamental factors of the new culture, be made ready that it might absorb a new principle. It was through the mission of Moses that humankind was first led to realize that the most positive feeling human beings can experience, a 
of the absolute reality of the all-pervading cosmic spirit, that divine principle that is ever active and interwoven throughout the whole earth, is centered in the I Am, the very midpoint of the human soul. But in order that these two simple words might be imbued with the utmost import, the I Am must first store within itself the full measure of a content that will once again embrace the world. To reach this end necessitated yet another mission, which is expressed in those deeply significant words of St. Paul, quote, Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Close quote. Moses had brought humanity up to the point of establishing a true culture of the human ego. This newborn intellect was destined to live on throughout the future ages, a gift from above, a form of civilization, a receptacle for the coming content. It was essential that the center of our being should first unfold in the bosom of the ancient Hebrew people. From that time onward would would this divine receptacle be filled with all that springs from a true understanding of the mystery of Golgotha and the events that took place in Palestine. Thus would the ego receive its new content, which itself would be a creation of the spirit world. We can most easily recognize all that came of that fresh inpouring and that owed its origin to the preparation and development of the Hebrew people when we refer to the book of Job. We cannot, however, rightly understand the wonderful tragedy portrayed there unless we take into account the peculiar characteristics of the Jewish race. We are told that Job, though he was a righteous man who believed in his God, was convinced that the Almighty was actually the true source of all his afflictions. He experienced disaster after disaster to his property, his family, and his own person. The Lord appeared to manifest in such a manner that Job might well have doubted whether indeed the great spirit of the cosmos was really active in the human ego. Matters went to such a length that Job's wife could not understand why her husband, despite all that had befallen him, should continue to trust in the Almighty. She therefore spoke to him in words of paramount import, quote, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Close quote, Job 2.9 What is the underlying, excuse, the underlying meaning of this significant allegorical tragedy and of the words, quote, Curse God and die? Close quote. It is here implied that if the God whom you regard as being the very source of your existence, visits you with sorrow and adversity, you may turn from him. But death will indeed be the lot of the one who would do this thing, for he who turns away from his God places himself outside the pale of the living course of evolution. The friends of Job could not believe that he had committed no transgression, for surely in the case of a righteous person equity should prevail. Even the narrator himself cannot make clear to us the justness of the circumstances, for he can say only that Job, who was thus stricken with misery and distress, nevertheless received compensation in the physical world for all that he had lost and suffered. Throughout this deeply significant allegory depicted in the book of Job, there is an, an, there is an echo of the Moses consciousness. In the story it is made clear that the Spirit brings to us enlightenment and ever manifests in the human being's innermost being. But during the course of earthly existence, the ego must live in contact with physical things. Thus it is that there are moments of transgression, in which human beings may weaken and lose their feeling of unity with the vital source of life. From the Christ impulse, humanity has learned that compensation for suffering and affliction is not to be sought in the physical world alone. We now know that in every case, when human beings are overcome by bodily distress, in sorrow and in pain, if they remain steadfast, they may indeed triumph over that which is material. For the ego is not merely illumined by the ultimate source of all that is spread throughout space and time, but is so conditioned that it may yet absorb the mighty power of the eternal. We find the same uplifting thoughts underlying St. Paul's words, quote, Yet not I, 
but Christ liveth in me. Close quote. Moses had brought humanity so far that it could realize that all things that live and weave throughout the cosmos manifest in deepest and most characteristic form in the ego. Human beings may comprehend the world if it is pictured as a simple unit proceeding from some great universal ego center. If we would indeed receive the eternal spirit within our being, then must we not regard merely temporal things or take heed only of the Jehovah unit, hidden and beyond all that is of space and time, but must we look also to the spontaneous and glorious benefaction, the Christ source, which underlies and is concentric with all unity. Thus do we recognize in Moses the personality of one who paved the way for Christianity. We have learned in what manner he instilled into humanity a consciousness of self, a consciousness that throughout the development of all future generations would be a storehouse to be filled with the substance of eternity, which means that it was yet to become a fitting receptacle replete with the essence of the Christ being. It is in this way that we picture the patriarch Moses in his relation to the progress and evolution of humanity. History always reveals its deepest truths when subject to thought and reflection of this nature. In a previous lecture devoted to Buddha, we drew attention to the fact that from time to time some outstanding personality arises through whose agency the eternal fount of wisdom springs once more to life, causing humanity to advance yet another step in its growth and development. When we ponder the circumstances connected with this or that great figure, there comes to us a sense of his true relation to the collective evolution of humanity. When we regard the development of the human race from this perspective, we find that we are involved in its progress in a vital sense. It is at once apparent that the spirits of the cosmos have some fixed and definite purpose associated with our existence, the object of which becomes more and more discernible as life proceeds. It is through the earnest consideration of the example and works of lofty spiritual individualities, together with profound meditation concerning outstanding events in the world's evolution and the history of humankind, that we may gain that sense of power, confidence of soul, and unswerving hope through which alone we may take our proper place in the totality of human evolution. If we regard the history of the world in this manner, we feel anew the beauty of Goethe's words, and we realize that the greatest benefit that can accrue to us through the study of universal history is the awakening of our enthusiasm. But it must be an enthusiasm that is not mere blind admiration and wonder, for it should prompt us to implant in our souls the seeds born to us from the past, so that they may bring forth goodly fruits in the time yet to come. The words of the great poet live again in somewhat modified form when, through the contemplation of those grand outstanding personalities and events of olden times, we realize this glorious truth, quote, The age is as a field in flower, where wondrous growth and life proceed, fresh buds unfold with every hour. Lo, all is fruit and all is seed. Close quote. Footnote in the German, I'll give it a try. Die Zeit, sie ist eine blühende Flur. Ein großes Lebendiges ist der Menschheit Werdegang. Und alles ist Frucht und alles ist Samen.